says that depends for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. desire and I long to worship you. You're my friend and you are my brother even though you are a king. I love you more than any other so much more than you. Again and again, we come to this space. Again and again, we gather as a community. Again and again, we move closer to God. And again and again, God is here. We are met. We are heard. We are shown the way. So again and again, let us worship our holy God. Hello, thanks so much for joining us today for our worship service on this third Sunday of Lent. Our theme today is again and again, we are shown the way. Now you may want to press pause and grab a few things that you'll find helpful. Your Bible, perhaps um, a candle to light and whatever it is you'd like to use as communion emblems for today. Once you've gathered those things, then unpause us and we will continue in worship together. Will you join me in prayer? Creator God, we don't just want to listen. We want to hear you. We want to read scripture aloud and know that you are as close as you always have been. We want to read scripture aloud and feel your word resonating inside our bones. We want to read scripture aloud and have your words stuck in our heads like a melody, falling off our lips like a love song. Creator God, we don't just want to listen, we want to hear you. So turn our hearts towards you, just as you turn strangers into disciples. Turn our ears towards you, just as you turn tables in the temple. We are listening and we lift our voices now to pray the prayer Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not unto temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25 in the Living Bible. 
I know very well how foolish it sounds to those who are lost when they hear that Jesus died to save them. But we who are saved recognize this message as the very power of God. For God says, I will destroy all human plans of salvation, no matter how wise they seem to be and ignore the best of them, even the most brilliant of them. So what about these wise men, these scholars, these brilliant debaters of this world? great affairs. God has made them all look foolish and shown their wisdom to be useful nonsense. For God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never find God through human brilliance. And then he stepped in and saved all those who believed his message, which the world calls foolish and silly. It seems foolish to to the Jews because they want a sign from heaven as proof that what is preached is true. It is. It is foolish to the Gentiles because they believe only what agrees with their philosophy and seems wise to them. May our Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. Amen. Standing in the need of prayer, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer, not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the preacher, not the teacher, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need the preacher, not the teacher, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of Our gospel reading comes from John 2, 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. The disciples, his disciples remembered that it was written, Deal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body, after he was raised from the dead. His disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The stories of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. 
My husband, John, calls me Captain Obvious. I have this knack for saying things that really are, well, not needed. You know, obvious, hence the name. For example, we'll get dinner all ready and sit down, and I'll ask, are you ready to eat? Well, gee, maybe he was just going to sit and look at it. Or when someone comes to the door and I say to them, Hi, did you come to visit? Well, no. I just wanted to ring the doorbell and leave. I do this all the time, and he finds it quite amusing. A friend of mine introduced me to a comedian this week. His name is Bill Engvall, and he does this routine called Here's Your Sign. He hates it when people say stupid things, so if they wore a sign, one could be forewarned. I found it quite hilarious because it reminded me of, what else? Captain Obvious. Maybe that would be my sign. He tells a story. A couple of fishermen were in their boat fishing and had a handful of fish on their string. And a guy walks up and he says, Hey, did you catch all those fish? Nope. I talked them into giving up. Here's your sign. A man drives into a repair shop with a flat tire. The service tech says, Hey there, did you get a flat? Nope. I was driving around and those other three tires just swelled right up. Here's your sign. Engvall's routine goes on and on, and I see myself and really many of us saying these phrases that he uses in his, in his uh, comedy routine. Um, we just have this tendency to say things that are obvious. Phrases and questions stating the obvious in the situation. So here's your sign. In our gospel reading today, we find Jesus healed, uh, headed to the temple for worship. And he finds it filled like a marketplace. Merchants are selling sheep and cattle and doves. And he makes himself a whip and he drives the sheep and cattle out. And then he turns to the money changers. And he upsets their tables, coins flying everywhere. And in the midst of the chaos, he is asked by the people to show a sign that he has the authority to do what he just did. I can just see Jesus' hand planted firmly on his forehead, shaking his head and saying, Okay, Captain Obvious. To the author of John, Jesus requires no introduction, no explanation of his authority or his place in the temple. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus is the Word enfleshed, no sign required. And yet the people in our story ask for a sign. Can't you just hear John saying, Hello, Jesus' very actions are the sign. John's gospel is invested in Jesus' divine authority and kinship with God. Jesus is powerful and in John's mind doesn't have to prove anything to anyone particularly those who insist on being obstinate and inflexible. By flipping the tables, Jesus disrupts the corruptive practices of the money changers. The taking advantage by overcharging comes to a halt. Doves were the sacrifice of the poor and of women, both of which were oppressed by the empire and by the religious system. 
Jesus disrupted the corruption that should not be taking place within the temple. Obvious signs to us, but apparently not so obvious to those standing there watching the disruption. No proof required. Someone give them a sign. In our scripture reading from 1 Corinthians, we find ourselves in the middle of a divided and squabbling congregation over a whole slew of things. As usual, Paul gets on his soapbox and he spews a bunch of rhetorical questions and statements that make our heads spin. Ultimately, his point centers on Christ. And for Paul, that's all that's required. He gets it. He understands the sign. No proof required. But Paul acknowledges that the Jews demand signs and the Greeks desire wisdom. Paul says, Christ crucified. Here's your sign. In both of our scriptures today, the characters want proof. They need a sign that Jesus is the real deal. Maybe Bill Engvall is right when he says it would make things so much easier or better if we carried around signs. Then we could read the sign and know what was going on because we are really not any different than the people in our readings. Our focus for this week's Lenten theme is again and again, we are shown the way. And it begs us to recognize that believing does not come natural for us. We are creatures with an insatiable curiosity. We are suspicious of much. And that includes our suspiciousness of what we see in the world and how it relates or doesn't relate to God's activity in the world. We want proof. We want answers that satisfy our curiosity. We want a sign. The cross and Jesus' death by crucifixion makes no sense in human terms. We value strength in our leaders, not not a grisly death at the hand of authorities. We want proof and we crave logical explanations just as much as the people to whom Paul was writing and to those present in the temple when Jesus walked in. Proclaiming a crucified and risen Christ is still countercultural. Following the way of Jesus continues to run against the grain of modern logic and expectation. Yet every Sunday, we worship and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we pray that God's kingdom will come. And like the church in Corinth, we still have our squabbles over who is worthy to be at the table. How the poor should be treated and how to speak truth to power and privilege. According to John, Jesus begins his ministry by showing more than telling. In the temple, Jesus disrupts and overturns the systems of corruption and profiteering taking place. But ultimately, Jesus points us to the promise of restoration. Paul reminds the Corinthians and us that God's wisdom is more expansive than we can imagine. We are shown the way, even if God's way feels foolish, countercultural, disruptive, or uncomfortable. In both of these stories, we see again and again, we are shown the way. 
the way God desires us to live, the way things in our world go against God's way for the world. Again and again we read the stories in our Bibles. Again and again we find examples of a world God envisions, a world where all of creation flourishes. We are shown again and again the way. So, Captain Obvious, this is our sign. Amen. Science tells us that a person makes about 35,000 choices in a day. 35,000 choices each and every day. Wow. In the prayer of confession, we pause to take a moment to think and to ask, how many of our decisions are choices God would have us make? How many are not? So let us pray together, knowing that we need guidance and trusting that even if we fall, God is showing us the way. Will you join me in prayer? Mighty and merciful God, giver of grace and goodness, we come as grateful children this day. We come confessing that we are not always grateful to you or as gracious to others we encounter in the twists and turns of our lives. We thank you that you have promised your forgiveness to us as we place our trust in you. Hear our prayers that we might be forgiven, renewed, and restored to a fuller life, the life you have shown us in Jesus the Christ. Hear our prayers, God, for the people you have called to be your church throughout the world. May we together become what you would have us be in fulfillment of Christ's mission. Help us to lead the way in justice and peace, to help the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison and other kinds of trouble. Help us to serve those who surround us as we would serve Jesus. We pray, God, for those who seek you or who seek to draw closer to you, that they may find you and be found by you. We pray for those near to us in their needs, as we have named them in this day, and for those we name in our hearts and for our own needs as well. Listen as we share our most intimate requests in silence. You are our source of strength, wisdom, and courage. You remain with us in all times and places. We praise you, God, for you give us grace to glorify you with our whole lives. Through the power and strength of Jesus the Christ, we offer our prayers. Seed is scattered and sown, wheat gathered and grown, bread broken and shared as one, the living bread of God. 
Come to the sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come, not because you are fulfilled, but because in your emptiness, you stand in need of God's mercy and assurance. Come, not to express an opinion, but to seek a presence and to pray for a spirit. Come then, sisters and brothers, as you are, partake and share. It is spread for you and me that we might again know that God has come to us, shared our common lot, and invited us to join the people of God's new age. As we each gather around our table, we remember the night that Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room. When he took the loaf of bread and blessed it and broke it and said to them, this is for you, take and eat, remember me. He lifted up the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant and this cup is for you. So take and drink and remember me. Each time we gather at this table, we remember and we proclaim the Lord's life, death, and resurrection until he comes again. It is God who invites us to this table and we come, each and every one of us, just as we are.
By the goodness of God, we are called into the family of the church. By God's grace, we rejoice to share in the church's life of mission and ministry. Let us offer our tithes and gifts to God's glory as a token of the offering of our very lives. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the generosity that enables us to share. We are rich in many things. Help us to empty ourselves of pretense, even as we pour out gifts of gratitude. We dedicate our offerings and ourselves to shaping the community that you intend. In the spirit of Christ, amen. As you leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go with courage, go with heart, go in peace. Amen. Go in peace and the peace of God be with you this day. Go in peace and the peace of God be with you always. Celebrate and share.